Relevant Bible answers for the most important questions in your life. How can I have healthier relationships? When and how will Jesus come again? And so much more. Don't leave your future to chance. Transform your life with truths from the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides. Prefer to watch while you read? Our brand new Prophecy Encounters DVD series makes the perfect companion set. Don't wait. Order your study guides and DVD set today by visiting afbookstore.com or by calling 800-538-7275. Good evening, friends, and welcome again to this special series called Foundations of Faith. This is a revival series where we're looking at some very important Bible truths upon which our faith is built. So I'm glad you joined us again, our local audience here in Silver Spring, Maryland. Thank you for braving the cold and the rain and coming out this evening. We'd also like to welcome those who are joining us on the various television networks and also watching online. I know there's a good group watching on Facebook as well, and I'd like to remind you, following the program this evening, we are going to take some time to do Bible questions. So if you'd like to post your Bible question there on Facebook, we're going to try and answer as many of them as we can following the program this evening. Now, we've been really blessed during this series so far to have John Lowe McCain leading out in the music, and Kelly is on the piano. And this evening, instead of our typical theme song that we do from night to night, we know we have an important presentation. Pastor Doug needs as much time as possible to cover all of the material. So instead of our regular theme song, John Law McCain is going to bring us a special musical item at this time. So thank you, John. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at him word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I Let me 
to invite you to stand as we have our opening prayer this evening. Dear Father in heaven, again, what a privilege to be able to gather together and open up your word. Father, we want to ask that as we study this very important subject, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide our hearts and our minds. Father, we are indeed grateful for the hope that we find in Scripture that one day soon Jesus will come and uh, the graves will break open of those that love you and there will be this glorious reunion day when Jesus comes again. So we just pray as we talk about this subject this evening that you'd guide us and be with Pastor Doug as he opens the word. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And again, we are just delighted to have the president of Amazing Facts, Pastor Doug Batchelor, who is leading us in this special revival series. So we'll turn the time over to him. Thank you, Pastor Ross. Thank you, Kelly and John, for the music. Thank you for coming on a a wet and blustery night. I had to go out and acquire an umbrella today. And I want to welcome our friends who are watching on television Or you may be watching on the internet via Facebook or one of the other many ways that this program is being distributed. We have a very important study tonight where we're going to be talking about the big issues of life and death. Now, it wasn't that long ago that uh, 2016, I think it was December 11, there was a tragedy in uh, Cairo, Egypt. A bomb went off in a Coptic Orthodox Church. It was St. Paul's Coptic Orthodox Church. 25 people were killed, 50 were injured, and um, it was the largest Coptic Church in Egypt, one of the largest church attacks. Uh, We've seen that recently in our country as well. But um, this especially unnerved the community there because that church was a church that had already become famous for a Mary apparition. Now you know what a Mary apparition is. There's a number of places around the world where they say they have seen Mary appear, the Virgin Mary, and miracles have been performed or she's spoken some words and a variety of other supernatural things have ostensibly happened. Back in 1968, above the dome of this church, someone actually snapped a photograph I have there on the screen, over a period of two years from 68 to 70 various evenings this glowing light would appear and hundreds sometimes thousands of people would gather Uh, some would say well it's the street lights that are reflecting and others say no I see her she's talking and and um, it became very famous for that now technically the Catholic Church frowns on these merry apparitions but Uh, In reality, they're supported. I think there's about 12 different cases that they have affirmed that the Virgin Mary actually appeared in different parts of the world. I think one here in North America, in New Mexico. The question is, where in the Bible do we hear that Mary is in heaven? Where in the Bible does it say that we're to pray to Mary? Now, don't misunderstand. Mary was a godly woman chosen by God. But we're talking about what the Bible says. You find even when you look in the writings of the reformers, there was confusion over this subject. For example, Martin Luther, who did recognize the saints. Matter of fact, at one time he nearly got killed by lightning. He cried out and said, Saint Anne, save my life and I'll become a monk. And he believed he had made a vow to Saint Anne. And so he left law school and entered a monastery. But then when it came to understanding what happens when you die, Luther believed, People went to sleep until the resurrection. He said this consistently through his writings. Here's one excerpt. Solomon judges, talking about Ecclesiastes, Solomon judges that the dead are asleep and feel nothing at all. For the, uh, the, dread lie there, the dead lie there, accounting neither days nor years. But when they are awoken, they shall seem to have slept scarce a minute. And then you've got Tyndale, that early English Bible translator. He's speaking on the subject of death. He said, in Christ it is indeed not death, but a fine, sweet, and brief sleep, which brings us release from the veil of tears and from all the misfortunes of this life. So even among the reformers, you'll find there were two varying views on what happens when a person dies. Some believed you went right to heaven or hell before the resurrection of the judgment. Others believed you slept, and it seemed like just a moment, but then they would rise later. 
and just about everything in between. And if you want to know what that confusion is like, walk around in a church cemetery and read the tombstones. In one church cemetery, you might go to a Baptist, one of these old Baptist or Methodist churches that have their own cemetery out back. You might find one tombstone that says R.I.P. You remember that statement? Rest in peace. Our dear mother sleeping in the arms of Jesus until the resurrection morn. Then you go two graves over and it says our mother singing with the angels in heaven. And you don't know, is she singing with the angels or is she sleeping in Jesus? There's a lot of confusion. I heard about a boy walking through a graveyard one day and he was reading the different tombstones and he came upon one where somebody had a little poetry and a sense of humor. And it said, stop my friend as you go by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon will be. So prepare yourself to follow me. Well, the boy had a quick wit and he had a crayon and so he wrote underneath, to follow you I'm not content until I know just where you went. <laughs> so people want to know what happens when a person dies. And that's our lesson today. If, uh, if I could speak to the Christian church at large, I would say we need a revival of understanding about the nature of man because misunderstanding could prepare you to be deceived in the last days. You'll understand as I go on. So the title of our subject is A Matter of Life and Death. We're going to go through a series of questions and I've got a lot to cover tonight. Number one, how does the Bible consistently refer to death? Well, you can read in John chapter 11. You remember when uh, Lazarus died and the disciples said, Lord, he's sick. You need to go visit him. He said, no, Lazarus is sleeping. Well, that's good. If he's sleeping, he'll get better. He said, no, no, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus used what term to talk about death? Sleep. Now, I believe, let me tell you what I believe the Bible teaches. And then I'll tell you why I believe it. And uh, we're just going to hit this straight on. I think the Bible is very clear that when a believer, when anybody dies, that they sleep a dreamless sleep with no consciousness of time and their next consciousness, and it may be a moment, a twinkling of an eye for them, is the resurrection. Hopefully you'll be in the first resurrection. The Bible says there are two resurrections. You've got the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of condemnation. You want to be in the first resurrection. You are in a resurrection and you look to your right and there's Adolf Hitler, that's bad news. You're probably in the wrong resurrection. And so, but there's a scripture that says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And people say, well, what does that mean? Well, if you're a believer and you die and you have no consciousness of time, your next conscious thought is a resurrection. A thousand years might go, but you're not aware of it, right? So for you, you're present with the Lord. But we live in the dimension of time. And so it hasn't happened yet because otherwise what would the point be for a resurrection and a judgment day that's still future if people go right to the rewards at death? Does that make sense? All right. Not only does it say there, oh, you know what, I want to say one more thing about Lazarus before I leave that point. This is the greatest of Jesus' miracles. You know, Jesus, um, he raised a girl who had just died in sleep and then he raised a, a man who was on his way to be buried and then Jesus raised someone who had been buried for four days. That's Lazarus. There's about a dozen resurrections in the Bible. Uh, every one of them when they rose said nothing about what they experienced. There wasn't one comment. Now today if someone had been dead buried for four days so they already were decomposing like Lazarus and they were raised every news agency in the world would be there pushing a microphone in their face and they'd all be asking what happened? But you notice Lazarus never makes a comment. He doesn't say oh, I was up in heaven enjoying heaven and Jesus brought me back down and now I'm in a grave again. He didn't say I was burning in hell and he brought me back up and thank you for rescuing me. He makes no comment about the big question because he had no consciousness. The Bible says that death is a dreamless sleep. Some other verses. Matthew 27 verse 52. And the graves were opened and many of the bodies of the saints which slept. Look in Psalm 13 verse 3. 
It says, Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Enlighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of, of death. So that's all through the Bible. Next question. Do dead people come back to converse with or to haunt the living? You know, everywhere you turn, people talk about haunted houses. And, you know, especially just coming off the... Halloween. Everybody was talking about, you know, what's haunted and it's spooky. And now there are evil spirits that will manipulate and harass people, but the dead people aren't bothering you. They don't know anything, the Bible says. Read in Job 14, 21, speaking of those who have died, he said, his sons come to honor. He knows it not. They're brought low. He perceives it not of them. See, first of all, if people went right to heaven when they died and you still have loved ones on earth that are struggling, how happy would you be in heaven? You wouldn't enjoy that very much. Job 7 verse 10 says, He shall not return to his house. They don't go back and haunt their houses. That's what the Bible says. So if you hear the shutters slapping and the doors creaking and all these things and footsteps going up and down the hall, just tell the demons to be quiet. You're trying to get some sleep. <laughs> but there's, there's really no ghosts that are there. Now the devil does sometimes try to harass people, but just know what it is and you'll probably get bored. Ecclesiastes 9.5. This one's really clear. For the living know that they'll die, but the dead know how much. The dead don't know anything. It goes on and says they have no more reward in anything done in this life under the sun. And just a few more verses. Psalm 115 verse 17. This is all through the Bible. The dead do not praise the Lord. Now I would think if I was saved and I died, what would be the next thing you'd do? You'd be in His presence. You'd praise the Lord. Right? if you were resurrected right away. And it says in Psalm 6 verse 5, In death there is no remembrance of thee. Isaiah 38 verse 18, Death cannot celebrate you. Psalms 146 verse 4, uh, it says in the whole thing, Put not your trust in princes, neither in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth, he returns to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. They're not thinking anything. And so the dead are not conscious, and it's very important for us to understand that. So, what happens when a person dies? The Bible tells you. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7 says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. What did God make Adam and Eve out of in the beginning? Dust. He said, Dust you are, and unto dust you will return. And he said, And the Spirit will return to God who gave it. And he said, Ah, oh, there it is. The Spirit goes off to God. Well, that word spirit there is a word roach in Hebrew and it simply means the breath of life. Now I'm going to prove that to you from another verse. If you look in Job 27 verse 3 it says, all the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now if the Spirit is a little soul or ghost or something like that, how many of you would want that in your nostrils? You know, the Bible says God breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living soul. So it's the combination of the breath of life and um, the body, you know, the elements of the earth we're all made of, and the dust of the earth he assembles and it becomes a living soul. It's not that God has a little ghost in you that pops out and goes off to heaven and you wait for the resurrection to be reunited with your body. The Bible doesn't teach that and yet that's what some churches are teaching and they're setting themselves up for potential deception by doing that. So where do the dead go when they die? Let's find out what the Bible says. Amen? Amen? Yet he will be brought to the grave and will remain in the tomb. It says uh, again, it says in uh, John chapter 5 verse 28, and all that are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Jesus is talking here about the second coming. He said I think three times in John chapter 6, Christ said, they'll live again the last day. And he says, they will come forth from, where are they? Their graves. So where are the dead now? They're in their graves. Number five, the Bible makes it pretty clear. When you read in the Bible, it's pretty clear. King David, the one who killed Goliath, is going to be saved. How many would agree with that? So if anybody's good, Jesus is called the son of David, you'd think that David would have died and gone right to heaven. If somebody's going to, you know, go to heaven without passing go, that would be David. But listen to what Peter says about King David in his sermon on Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 2. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, 
that he is both dead, that's a picture of his tomb up there, as you can see it today, he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher, his tomb, is with us unto this day. He said it's right here in the city. And then he goes on and says later on verse 24, David is not ascended into the heavens. So, dead, buried, not in heaven. So it's not really fair for us to create another option and say, well, it's because he's in purgatory or he's in limbo or he's in Abraham's bosom. David, or Peter made it as clear as he could make it that he's dead. Now David, the Bible says he slept with his fathers. That's what the Bible says. Um, That's roughly 3,000 years ago. Jesus is coming soon, I believe. When the trumpet blows and Jesus comes and the graves open and David comes up, how long will it seem like for David? A moment. Twinkling of an eye. Any of you remember when you were a teenager and you'd go to sleep and the next thing you knew the alarm rang and 16 hours had gone by? (laughs) You had no problem sleeping that long back then. Um, And you think, wow, did I go to sleep? I thought I just laid down. And just like that. Well, that's what it's going to be like. So for the believers to be absent from the body, your next conscious thought is the presence of the Lord, but it hasn't happened yet. We live in this dimension of time. Hasn't happened yet in history. So when beings ostensibly appear and they say, I've come from God from heaven, they're they're dead people from the Bible or somewhere else, and they start giving you messages, you might be hearing messages, but maybe they're not messages from God. I'll say more about that. Is there anyone in heaven now? Yeah, Yeah, well, I'm talking about obviously besides Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the angels, unfallen beings. I'm talking about from earth. Yeah, there are a few. Mark 9, verse 1 through 8. You remember when they climbed the mountain, Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus and spoke. Because Elijah went to heaven in a fiery chariot. He was an exception. The Bible tells us in the book of Jude, verse 9, that Michael the archangel came and resurrected Moses so Moses could watch the children of Israel cross over into the promised land. It was a special resurrection. But generally, it's appointed unto man once to die, and they stay in their graves until the judgment day, which is still future. Am I right? And you can also read there's another small group. It tells us in Matthew 27, when Jesus died, there was a great earthquake, And the graves were opened, and many, not all, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep locally around Jerusalem were raised, and coming out of their graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This must have been a small group. It was a local group. We don't know who it was. might have been Isaiah. It could have been Jeremiah or one of the other prophets that were raised. It wasn't David. Small group. Matter of fact, the other gospel writers don't even mention this. But at the resurrection of Jesus, he led captivity captive. He took a trophy, small sample of resurrected saints with him to the kingdom. So that's all we know about that. But the general resurrection is in the last day. So why does Satan want us to believe that the spirits of the dead are really alive? It tells you in the Bible, Matthew 24, verse 24 and 25, Christ warns us, for there will arise false Christs and false prophets, and they will show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, it would deceive even the very elect. And what could be more convincing than if somebody is visited by a spirit of the departed? Does it happen? I was just in my hotel room since I've come here, and my TV, when I turn it on in the hotel, always starts at the the same channel every time so I've got to go and try to find something decent to watch and I scanned by where this person was giving counsel to another person and I I thought what's going on here they said I've got messages from your dead father I thought boy that's really spooky and the person was drinking it in oh yes oh that's wonderful I'm so glad to hear it and they say all these lovely encouraging things and they never say your father told me to tell you he doesn't really love you they never say anything like that There have been a couple of books that have come out, you know, 20 minutes in hell, or uh, someone 20 minutes in heaven, or, and uh, they, this, they made a movie about one called Heaven, Is It For Real, about this baby who supposedly dies, and he 
has these scenes and sees all their departed loved ones and, and seems to come back knowing stuff that how would he know? Well, does the devil know about grandpa? Now, all the things that the boy knows in the story, the devil would have known and could have revealed. Can the devil give information and visions to people? You know the story of King Saul? Just before he committed suicide, he went to see a witch who is a medium and brought up a spirit that pretended to be Samuel the prophet. And he died the next day. And the devil used that whole scenario. A witch doesn't have the power to resurrect anybody. It was an apparition to deceive. And the devil's going to do that again in the last days. And people say, well, but I, I've had a near-death experience. You know, I died on the operating table, and I saw Jesus. And I had a dream, and it changed my life. Well, you know, I don't know what you experience. You don't have to die to have a dream from Jesus. People have dreams that change their lives. You can have a dream from the devil that will scare you half to death. Even Job talks about the terrors of night when his hair crawls. And so having a dream doesn't mean that it's from God. And if we're going to base our theology on dreams people have when their heart stops and the oxygen stops running to their brain, do you know in North America, Christians, when they die on the operating table or temporarily die, they often think about Jesus. If you go to India and they have near-death experiences, they think about Krishna and, and the Hindu gods. Uh, and if you go to China or some of the other countries, they dream, they say, I died and Buddha appeared to me. And so whatever their religious belief happens to be in their culture, that tends to be the, the spiritual revelation they have when their brains are robbed of oxygen. And so are you going to base your theology on someone's near-death experience? Everybody around the world has different ones. I, I've got friends that said, oh, I had this experience, you know, and I died on the operating table, I was going through this tunnel, and I was going to be reincarnated, and there was a pink door and a blue door, and they said, if you go through the pink door, you'll be a girl in your next life, and you go through the blue door, you're going to be a boy in your next life, and that was when I hung around with all these hippies that took LSD, and, and we believed in reincarnation, and, and so that was their experience, and so I don't... And, you may have had it. I've met people who caught me after a program like this and say, Pastor Doug, I know what the Lord spoke to me. I died on the operating table. And I don't question that their heart stopped. Now, if someone removed your brain and put it back again, that would really impress me. But typically, when your heart stops, you're not dead yet. It just means your, your brain is robbed of oxygen. And um, you're going to have all kinds of hallucinations. I used to play a game with my brothers. Don't ever do this. It's very unhealthy where we would hyperventilate and then they would squeeze you and you, we would choke each other out that way. You, some of you know what I'm talking about? Don't do that. It's not good for you. <laughs> and when they did that to me, I had visions. I don't remember them all right now, but that's not where you base your theology. So how effective will Satan's use of these evil spirits be in the last days? Revelation 18 verse 23 by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Revelation 12, verse 9, that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. And one of the ways he deceives is through spiritualism. Communication with the dead. Listening to noises and mutterings and knockings and, and the tarot cards and having your palm read and, and astrology. You know, my mother, when I grew up, she was a writer. She was in the entertainment business in New York City. She had friends that wrote astrological columns for the newspaper that people read every day. And I remember asking them, I said, do you believe these things? They said, no. The people who were writing the horoscopes that the papers were buying said, they don't even believe this. I said, I've got to write a new one. I mean, do we really believe that because of the time of year you were born and the month that you're going to be a certain way, you're destined to be a certain way? The nearest star is um, four light years away, Alpha Centauri or Alpha Proxima, meaning if you travel 186,000 miles a second, it can take you four years to get to the nearest star. They have absolutely no illumination or gravitational pull on our world. And the idea, depending on where the star is out, it's going to affect your life and your destiny. Think about that. I used to be a hippie. I was all into that. Hi, where, what's your sign? I'm a Pisces. What are you? Oh, yeah, we should really get along. 
And when you think about I don't want to insult anybody, but really, it, there's nothing to it. And my mother, she wrote a whole record, 12 songs. She was a songwriter. Astrological love songs. She had a song for every symbol of the zodiac. And people bought the record. My mother didn't even believe it. And people were probably listening to Oh, yeah, that's me. It's like fortune cookies. Sorry. Sorceries shall have their part. Those who are involved in sorceries will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, the Bible's pretty clear. Old and New Testament Christians should have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, having your palm read and your cards read. And you're, you're playing actually with um, spiritual uh, sciences there that are, are not healthy. Ouija boards. We did all that growing up, and it's just not good. Number nine. Since wizards and psychics cannot contact the dead, who are they contacting? Revelation 16, verse 14. They are the spirits of what? Devils doing what? Working miracles. Can devils work miracles? Can devils create illusions? Can they impersonate? Do they know what your ancestors look like? Now, Pastor Doug, are you telling me that every time, you know, my husband died, and I, I love my husband. I'm just creating this scenario, scenario here. And we were married 50 years, and I just sense his presence, and I know he's watching over me. How many of you have heard that? You know, though they're gone now, but we know they're watching over us. And, and, you know, Robin Williams died, and he's in heaven telling jokes to Jesus and the, making the angels laugh, and we always say all these things. And, but that's not what the Bible teaches. You may think about your loved one and feel their presence because your mind is filled with them. And so it's on your mind. Um, and God may want to comfort you when it, by giving you a dream or something to encourage you that they're going to be okay. I don't know. But you don't base your theology on that. Do lost people go directly to hell at the time of death? Now we're talking about the lost, not the saved. This is... This is really part two of this presentation, and it's very important. Understanding this, I can't overemphasize um, how crucial it is. Because there's a lot of dear Christian people that are taught something that is not taught in the Bible. That if you're good, you die, you go right to heaven. If you're bad, you die, you go right to hell. And while your loved ones are walking the earth... You're burning in fire and brimstone in, in just unexplainable agony, blistering and screaming, and it's going to happen forever. You aware that a lot of Christians believe that? Think about that for a moment. You got a 15-year-old girl. She turns her back on Jesus. Um, she dies in a lost condition. Maybe she doesn't know about Jesus, but she dies lost. She's past the age of accountability. So as soon as she dies, she's going to get plunged in a molten lake of fire and brimstone, and she's going to writhe and scream and, and in anguish and pain. I don't know if any of you remember, but not too long ago, a, um, I think it was a Jordanian pilot was shot down. He ejected, and ISIS got a hold of him. And they put him in a cage bars, they doused him with gasoline, and they videotaped him burning to death. Now some people think that's what God does. That's a doctrine of devils. The Bible tells us God is love. I want to show you from the Bible what it says about what happens to the lost. There is punishment for sin, and just in case anyone misunderstands, before you change the channel, <laughs> I do believe in hell. I do believe in the punishment. I don't believe it lasts for eternity. Let's find out what the Bible says. Does that sound fair enough? Amen. Job. Let's find out where, where they go. Job 21, verse 30, 32. The wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. He will be brought forth. He's reserved. He'll be brought forth to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. And so the wicked is reserved. He's waiting. You can read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 
the Lord knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So are they being punished now? Or are they being reserved? Matthew 13, listen to what Jesus said. He tells that parable of the wheat and the tares. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. When are they going to be punished? The end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they'll gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, we talked about the law, and cast them into a furnace of fire. So is there fire? Is there punishment? Yes. Is anyone burning in hell now? No. And that's very important to understand. Jesus said, John 12, verse 48, The word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. When is the judgment? Jesus said it's in the future. It's not right when they die. Number 11, what will happen to the wicked in hellfire? This is the point I especially want you to capture. For yet a little while, and the wicked will not uh, be. The wicked shall perish into smoke, they will consume away. The Bible says they're going to be devoured. Malachi 4, verse 1 through 3. The day will come that will burn as an oven, and all that do wickedly and all the proud will be stubble. It's like after a field has been harvested in the summer, and then they, they set it on fire and they scorch it, and there's just a charred stubble that is left. The day that comes will burn them up. And you will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear. The wicked are going to be burnt, but do they burn forever? You know, I get passionate about this because um, even though my mother and father were pretty much agnostic, they sent me for whatever reason to two different Catholic schools. And I was taught, like millions of others, you don't have to be a Catholic, you can be a Baptist, a number of churches that you're bad and I wasn't a real good boy you die and you're gonna go to a lake of fire and the idea of burning through eternity do you know think about eternity that means a billion years go by and somehow you swim to the surface of this burning molten lava and you cry out Lord how long and he says well you haven't even started a billion more years go by and he says you still haven't started you know what eternity is I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy for 10 minutes. I hated God. I said, if there is a God, he's a sadist. I mean, first of all, I don't remember anyone asking me if I wanted to be born. I, I used that against my father one day. He it's your fault I'm here. You ever heard your kids say that to you? <clears throat> I was having a hard time. I said, why has life got to be so hard? I didn't ask to be born. And then there's a God who says, because you're having a hard time and you're not being good, I'm going to burn you forever and ever. Well, that's a wonderful world view, isn't it? You know how many people out there have that? So if you want to understand what's going to happen in the judgment, the Bible says there are a couple of cities that are exhibit A of what to expect. What two cities are given as an example for the destruction of the wicked? Sodom and Gomorrah. 2 Peter 2 verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example to those who should afterward live ungodly. Sodom and Gomorrah are an example. Well, how were they burned? Notice this. You read in Jude verse 7, And Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now that's, there you got it, Pastor Doug. It's eternal fire. What does that mean? That means the result of the fire is eternal. It burns them so they are burnt up forever. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? Did God rain fire down out of heaven and burn them up? Yes. Here's actually a picture of the area down south of the Dead Sea. It's the lowest point on earth, not far from where Sodom and Gomorrah were. There's nothing burning down there now. They were burnt up with eternal fire, meaning they were never given a second chance. And the wicked are burnt with eternal fire. The results of it are eternal. Where will hell fire be located? Well, you read, it's actually going to be here on earth. It's going to be especially hot, not far from where you're sitting in Washington, D.C., I suppose. <laughs> it says, they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about 
and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The idea that, you know, hell is a chamber somewhere, and by the way, this is at the end of Revelation chapter 20 where it talks about Satan gathers all the wicked Gog and Magog and they attack the city of God and when they launch their final attack, God rains fire down from heaven, devours them, everyone burns according to what they deserve, forms a big lake of fire, God uses that to purify the planet. And uh, that's when you read in Second Peter chapter 3 verse 10, the elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein will be burned up. That's hellfire. But I was always taught that, you know, if you dig deep enough, that's where the devil lives, way down in hell. Now, you know why we come up with that tradition? Is there's four words that are used for hell in the Bible. Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus. Most of the time in the Old Testament, it's Sheol, and that simply means the grave. That's all it means, the grave. It means going down into Sheol meant you go down into the grave. Most people don't go up to their grave, they go down to their grave. And so because people said you go down to the grave, Hades came from Greek mythology. There's a god named Pluto who was in charge of the underworld, again down. And those ideas affected Christianity, and so they said, yeah, the devil, he's in charge of hell. He's down there with his leotards and his pitchfork, and he's way down. He's got this chamber. I was standing in line one day at a store checking out. How many of you will admit you sometimes read the tabloid headlines? Don't admit if you buy them. <laughs> but you're standing there sometimes you go, <coughs> you know. <laughs> and I read one of them, this was years ago, and it said, Russian oil drillers go too deep and hit hell voices of demons heard shrieking from the opening <laughs> or demons escaped or something like that I you know could hardly keep from laughing right there in line but it doesn't say that in the Bible hell means the grave isn't it true that only the body dies but the soul is immortal have you heard this before no I, I want to get a camera shot go ahead you can turn that around because I want to I want to ask you um, tell me please where is the verse in the Bible that says we have an immortal soul? Always, you know, willing to take a risk. There is no verse, is there? And yet, how many people sing about and preach about and talk about you got an immortal soul? You'll either live forever in heaven or you'll live forever in hell, but you can't die, you're going to live forever. Isn't that kind of what the devil said? He said, you will not surely die. You're like gods, you're going to live forever. God said, you disobey, you'll die. We get two choices, life or death. And the devil has deceived a lot of the world and they're, they're going to have a bunch of surprises and they're setting themselves up for uh, deception. <clears throat> you can read, does the soul die? Is the soul immortal? Ezekiel 18.4, the soul that sinneth, it will what? It'll die. Job 4.17, shall mortal man be more just than God? That's a good question. I mean, you wouldn't burn your dog forever and ever. Well, let me finish reading this. 1 Timothy 6.15 The King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only has immortality. Is that pretty clear? So when do the righteous receive immortality? You can read in 1 Corinthians 15, and this is so clear. It says, we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, you know the Bible says, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, this mortal must put on immortality. Paul says, we're mortals now, but we get our immortal bodies when Jesus comes. The wicked do not have immortality. God is not going to give immortality to a sinner. Why would you want to immortalize sin? God wants to eradicate sin. He wants a universe that is pure. He doesn't want like a maximum federal prison somewhere with all the sinners burning forever. And where's the justice in that? I used to live up in the mountains. And uh, some of you know my story. I, I lived in a cave for about a year and a half. And I was a hermit. And ultimately found a Bible up there and became a Christian. But when I lived up in the cave, I had a cat. And the cat's name was Stranger. And I called him that because... He just showed up one day, and I was way back in the mountains. He just stayed with me. And um, 
he would occasionally do what cats do. He'd catch a, mice, a mouse, you know, and he'd catch these little cute little kangaroo rats, these little desert, they look like little kangaroo rats is what they look like. They got a furry tail and, and you know, cats are kind of sadistic. If a dog catches something, it just eats it. Usually it doesn't even chew. But a cat, he plays with his food. And he doesn't want to kill it right away. He wants it to kind of die slowly. Which is why I don't think there'll be any cats in heaven. So I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just kidding. Uh, we just, we had a cat for 14 years, just passed away. But, um, Anyway, so a stranger caught this mouse, and I was cooking my dinner out there at my campfire, and he, he's playing with it, you know, and he, he'd let it go, and it's there quivering, you know, and it, it tried to hop away again. He'd pounce on it, and, and uh, then he let it go, and he would do it. Just, you know, I always felt bad for the poor little thing, but he's a cat. He's got to eat, and so I just, you know. And this one time, he let it go and the thing went to hop away and it was dazed and trying so much to get away from the cat it hopped into the fire listen to you I'm talking about a rat and you're all grieving out there you hate the idea of a rat burning for a few seconds am I right? isn't that right? I said the rat hopped in the fire you went oh oh and yet if I say that God is going to take people and put them in the fire for eternity, there are people who think, well, yeah, yeah, he's God, he can do that. But in our hearts, we know there's something wrong with that, don't we? Will the devil be in charge of hellfire? <laughs> yeah, have you seen these pictures before? The devil is there standing on this molten, you know, glowing red cavern. He's got his pitchfork. First of all, could you trust him to be fair in the way people are? That's like having the fox guard the chicken coop. You don't want the devil in charge of hell. And the devil that deceived them, you read in Revelation 20.10, he was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Amen? The devil is going to go to hell. Matter of fact, the hell is not originally prepared for you. You read in Matthew chapter 25.41, it says, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And the work of that fire is eternal. It is everlasting. When the devil and his forces are destroyed, we never have to worry about them escaping again. They're gone. But the devil's not in charge of hell. He fears it. The Bible says he's come down with great wrath because he knows his time is short. That's in Revelation chapter 12. So are both the body and the soul destroyed in hell? Some people say, well, Pastor Doug, you're right, you know. It says pretty clearly that the, the body is destroyed, but the soul is what burns forever and ever. Uh, let's find out what Jesus said. These are the words of Christ. Matthew chapter 10. Fear not him which can kill the body, but is not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy soul and body in hell how much more clear can you be what happens in hell soul body destroy now a few years ago I was um, up in the hills <clears throat> do some of you remember um, you know family radio there's a speaker who became rather famous or infamous named Harold Camping now family radio has some great programs. I still listen, you know, they, they read the Bible, they got some nice music, and, and I used to listen to it. I was up in the hills, I had a battery radio, lived up in the woods, and at night I'd listen. He had a program called Open Forum where he'd take Bible questions. And I'd get so exasperated at some of the answers. And, but I'd still listen. And I'd be up to sometimes just talking to myself. I'd so mad. Oh man, that's not right. That's not in the Bible. What are you telling? And one time I remember that he got this call and a lady called and she said, Brother Cammie, I've got a question and she said, my son died last week he was not a Christian he was driving, he was drunk and he hit a tree is he burning in hell right now? and he tried to kind of skirt an awkward question and she said, no, 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 I'm telling you I know he wasn't a Christian where is he? and he said, well, you know yeah there's only two choices that he's in hell and you could hear the lady make this gasping noise and she hung up the phone 
Oh, that bothered me so much. And then immediately after that, a college student got on. She said, I'm a young college student. I want to believe in God. I want to love Jesus. But the idea that he would take these objects that he's created and torture them forever and ever for the sins of one lifetime, I don't see the justice in that. And he started giving some mealy-mouthed answer about that. And at this point, I'm just, I'm walking in circles. I'm so mad. I thought, I got to call in. But I didn't have a telephone. And they, they had not invented cell phones back then. So I got in my car and I drove to a friend's house that was like 12 miles away and I went storming and they said, let me borrow your phone. And I prayed all the way down. I said, help me get through. Because there's people all over the country calling. So that would have been a miracle by itself. First time I called, busy signal. Second time I called, they said, please stand by. So I waited. And then next thing I know, he comes in, welcome to Open Forum. I said, Brother Camping, I'm a Christian. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I wanted people listening to know where to go. And said, I believe the Bible clearly tells us that once a person dies, if they're lost, first of all, they sleep until the resurrection. And the lost do not burn forever and ever in hell. The Bible says they are devoured. The Bible says they are consumed. The Bible says they are burnt up. The Bible says they perish. The Bible says never will they be anymore. And I started going after one, one verse after another. And my friend had a radio on next to him. Pretty soon I noticed I wasn't hearing my voice anymore. He had, had pried a pause button. And then he came back and he let me respond to his answers. And then he hung up on me. He wouldn't take any more questions for the remainder of the program. And I was praying that those people were listening. And on my way home that night, I was praying. I said, oh, Lord, I wish someday I could have a radio program and give people the right answers. Amen. And you know what happened? God gave us a radio program. Amen. And for the last 20 years, we've been sharing the answers on Bible Answers Live with people. And we've had a lot of people written us and said, praise the Lord, I can love Jesus now. Because I never knew this before. Well, you want to hear the rest of the story? Before Harold Campion died, he changed his view on the state of the dead in hell. And if you listen to the program in the last few years of his broadcast, you know that. But um, there's a lot of people out there that are just struggling to love God because they don't understand this subject about life and death. Number 18. What are the only two choices for all people? The Bible is pretty clear. It says the wages for sin is what? It doesn't say the wages for sin is eternal life in the fire. Death means absence of life. The wages for sin is death. It is the gift of God to get everlasting life for the saved. There's only two choices. Why did God evict Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden? You remember what he said? Lest they reach out, take from the tree of life, eat and live forever they are not going to live, they're going to die, and they're not going to live forever because they're not going to eat from the tree of life. You've got to eat from the tree of life if you want to live forever. The tree of life will only be acceptable, or accessible, I should say, to the redeemed. So this idea that the, the wicked are somehow immortalized, the Bible doesn't teach that. That's kind of come out of mythology and some misunderstandings, and, and the church really needs a reformation in their understanding of this because... There's people out there that would love God and believe in God if they knew the truth. Brilliant people like Mark Twain and Robert Ingersoll, and I can name many others that became atheists, Voltaire. You know why they became atheists? Because what the church was teaching about hell and death was so abhorrent to their reasoning. They said, how could you ever love a God that would do that to somebody? That would torture a person forever and ever for the sins of and you know what else that means? That means that Adolf Hitler, Stalin, who are responsible for the death of millions of people, are n have not burned as long as Cain, who killed one person. See, according to the modern teaching right now, they're basically saying, well, Cain, he killed somebody, he died, he went to hell, and he's only killed one person, but he's burned 5,000 years longer than Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin. Where's the justice in that? Now, are there varying degrees of reward? Yes. Jesus said, He that knew his master's will and did not do it will be beaten with many stripes. He that did not know with few stripes. If everybody burns forever and ever, everybody gets the same reward. But the Bible says there's varying degrees of punishment, and that can mean in time or in intensity. We don't know how God's going to do it, but Jesus said he'll reward everyone according to his works. But if everybody goes to the same lake of fire... You know, really, you're all going to burn forever and ever. I, there's no justice in that. 
God is a God of love. He is a just God. And so I know there's some difficult verses, and I hope some of you will write down, and maybe we'll have time in our follow-up program to uh, answer some of these other questions. But they're good Bible answers. And once you understand this, it makes it easy to love God. This, for me, was so liberating. I said, you know, I can see where God is a loving God. Oh, wait, I got a couple more thoughts for you on that. He goes on and says, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but what? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. What are the two choices? Perish or life. Amen? Amen? Now think about this. What is the penalty for sin? Death. Does it say anywhere in the Bible the penalty for sin is burning forever? Did Jesus pay our penalty on the cross? And how long was He on the cross? It says three days and three nights, but from Friday night till Sunday morning. Was He on the cross forever and ever? No. If the penalty for sin is everlasting torment in the fire, Jesus didn't pay your penalty. Did you get that? How does the Bible refer to this work of destruction of the wicked? Does God enjoy it? Oh, no. Isaiah 28 says, The Lord shall be wroth that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. God has no desire at all that the wicked should die. I remember one time my cousin had a kitten. The dog got a hold of the kitten, broke its back. And there's nothing that could be done. And in spite of what I just told you about cats, it broke my heart that I had to take the cat out and put it to sleep, as you say. Was it the loving thing to do? It was. You know, sinners are miserable. God is going to put them out of their misery, but He doesn't enjoy it. It is His strange act. God wants to make life. He wants the world to be good, good, to be very good. So after sin and sinners are destroyed, what will Jesus do for His people? Ah, uh, this is so exciting, friends. He tells us in 2 Peter 3.13, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a what? A new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. And God has promised He will wipe away all tears from our eyes, and there'll be no more death. Notice this, neither will be, there be any more sorrow or crying, neither will there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. No more death. No more pain, no more sorrow. If the Bible says no more pain, that must mean that there's no torture chamber somewhere where people are shrieking. If the Bible says all things are made new, that means there's no old sinners that are being burnt somewhere. God is going to purify the universe. And He wants you to be in that new world with Him. But He's offering to purify you now. And we need to come to Him just like we are if we want that experience. Would you like to have that experience, friend?